Now, friends, we come to the fourth chapter of Leviticus. We've been talking about the five offerings that are in these five chapters. And we have seen the first three offerings. They are called sweet savor offerings. And now we come to the first non-sweet savor offering. The first three were the burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering. Now we come to the first of two non-sweet savor offerings. The first is the sin offering, and that is sin as a nature. And then we're going to see the trespass offering, and that's sin as an act. You see, man actually is a sinner on two counts. He's a sinner by nature, and he's a sinner because of what he does. By the way, he does what he does because he is a sinner by nature. Now, we see here the person of Christ in those first three offerings. Now we see the work of Christ on the cross for sin. There are several very striking features about the sin offering that set it apart from the other offerings and distinguish its importance. Now, first of all, I think this is something you can see quite easily. In the burnt offering, there were just 17 verses in that first chapter. In the meal offering, there were 16 verses in the second chapter. The peace offering we saw last time in the third chapter, 17 verses. Now, the next chapter, chapter 5, the trespass offering, there are 19 verses. All are just about the same. But do you notice here in the sin offering? 35 verses, more than twice the number of verses in the first three offerings. Evidently, the Spirit of God thought this was very important. Now, the sin offering was an entirely new offering. Up to the time of Moses being given the instructions here in the wilderness for this sin offering, there is no record anywhere of a sin offering. There's no previous record of it occurring in Scripture. And no heathen nation had anything that was even similar to it. Now, that in and of itself is quite interesting. Why? Well, this third very interesting thing to note is, from the time of the giving of the law, it became the most important and significant offering of all. You see, man was a sinner before the giving of the law. But actually, it was the law that revealed to him he was a sinner. And it was offered during all of the feasts. It became all important. During the time of the Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Tabernacles, and it was offered on the great day of atonement, Yom Kippur. It brought the high priest into the holy of holies, the sin offering. And then there's a fourth thing that makes it quite remarkable. It's in contrast to the burnt sacrifice, although it was made in the same place. For instance, in the law of the sin offering in Leviticus 6.25, I read, "...speak unto Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering." In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord its holy. In other words, actually where the burnt offering leaves off, the sin offering begins. The burnt offering tells who Christ is. The sin offering tells what Christ did. In the burnt offering, Christ meets the demands of God's high and holy standard. In the sin offering... Christ meets the deep and desperate needs of mankind. In the burnt offering, we see the preciousness of Christ. In the sin offering, we see the hatefulness of sin. The burnt offering was voluntary. The sin offering was commanded. The burnt offering ascended. The sin offering was poured out. And that means down. One went up, the other went down. Now, we have here in this chapter, and by the way, it goes into the next one also, we have the sin offering, sin is a nature. And we have in the first two verses, sins of ignorance. 
Then verses 3 to 12, sins of the priests. Then sins of the congregation, 13 through 21. Then sins of the ruler, verses 22 and 26. Then sins of the common people, 27 to 35. And then you have the law of the sin offering over in chapter 6, 24 and 30. Now, will you note here, this I think is very important for us to see. We have here sins of ignorance. I'm reading now verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them. Now, these are sins of ignorance. The emphasis is here upon a sin that's committed in ignorance. Now, if a man sinned willfully and deliberately, this offering did not avail. You'll recall the Scripture says, "...he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses." In other words, there was no salvation and there is no salvation for a person today who willfully rejects Jesus Christ. And if you want an unpardonable sin, there's actually no act you commit, but if you willfully reject him, which is a state, of course, and not necessarily an act, but if you do that, my friend, there's no remedy. And that is what he's saying here. Now, sins of ignorance... I think reveals the underlying truth that man is a sinner by nature. I don't want to be ugly, but I must say this to you. My friend, you're a sinner whether you know it or not. <laughs> you may not commit a sin, but you're a sinner. You've got that nature, and that's the reason we commit sin. It's because we are sinners by nature. David says, "...in sin did my mother conceive me." Now, regardless, therefore, of the estimation of any given time or custom, man is a sinner in God's sight. You and I are sinners by nature. We do those things that are contrary to God. And it's impossible for the natural man to do anything that'll please God. He doesn't have the capacity. He's a sinner by nature. And these sins of nature, and they are that, they are sins that must be called to our attention because it's sin regardless of who commits it. And the sin offering gave a profound conviction of sin that stands out in the literature of the race as there's nothing to compare to it. The deep guilt complex of man must be diagnosed before an adequate remedy can be prescribed. Listen to the psalmist, Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And that is what I call getting on the Lord Jesus Christ's couch instead of going to the psychiatrist. A great many people with a guilt complex today go to the psychiatrist, and the impression is given that the psychiatrist or the psychologist has a skill that the Word of God does not reveal. I personally think that is a wrong impression to give. I believe that the Word of God contains the remedy today for man. And if you have your hang-ups and you are bothered with a personality complex or problem, why don't you go, really? Get on his couch and cry out, Search me, O God. Try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. And listen to David. He got up on God's couch and he confessed, Psalm 51, 4, Against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. My friend, your problem, my problem, is not because that our mother didn't give us all the love we should have when we were a little stinking brat. Our problem is we're a sinner by nature. 
And the thing to do is to get up on God's couch and tell him all about it. And if we did that, it'd be helpful. You see, the sins of ignorance were committed by a person who at the time didn't know that it was sin. Again, the psalmist, Psalm 19:12, "...who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults." Oh, how many of us need to go to God today and just confess that we're not in the world, but just low-down human beings. If you can't think of anything specially to confess, then just tell him that you want to confess because you're who you are. Mel Trotter tells about the time that he had a doctor on his mission board back in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they got down on their knees every Saturday morning. Each board member would pray, and this man always would pray, Lord, if we've committed any sin, forgive us. And Mel Trotter got tired of him saying that little formula, that little Christian cliche you hear today. And Mel Trotter says to him, why don't you tell him what the sin is? And this doctor said, well, I don't know what it is. And Mel Trotter says, well, why don't you guess at it? And then Mel Trotter made the statement. He says, you know, he hit it the very first thing. The very first time, he just hit it right. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Now, we need to go to him. If a man sins through ignorance, rashness, or accident, God made provision for his deliverance. God has a remedy for you. I don't care who you are. Then in Numbers 35, 11, it says, "...then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person unawares." God has a city of refuge for you. When you commit a sin and you don't know what it is even, chances are you do. But if you don't, go and tell him you're a sinner. Listen to John. "...my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not." And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, Paul explains the reason that he was the chief of sinners and why he obtained mercy. First Timothy 1, 13 and 15, "...who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant." with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I remember my dad died and I was 14. I was put in the business world. I got with the wrong crowd and I was out doing things, I'll be honest with you, that a man 25 years old was doing. And I was just 16 years old. And I'm not offering it as an excuse, but I really didn't know how bad it was. And then there came that day when I did come to Christ. And from that day to this, I look back and hate myself for what I did. Thank God, friends, (laughs) there's a sin offering. He died. And I can go and tell him all about it. I don't have to crawl up on somebody's couch and tell him none of his business. For it sure is God's business. He dealt with my sin on the cross. Listen to the psalmist again. Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. You see, that lifts the guilt complex. But the sin offering even taught its own inadequacy. It had to point to someone else sacrifice and offering thou didn't not desire mine ears hast thou opened burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required that sin offering pointed to Christ and it pointed the way to God's perfect satisfaction and forgiveness having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Vernon McGee, a sinner, can come into his presence with boldness. 
Why? Because Jesus was my sin offering. And it was for these sins of ignorance even. Now we have the sins of the priests, verses 3 through 12. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. Now, the sin of the priest is considered first. Why? Well, he stood in the place of leadership. If he's wrong, the people were wrong. His sin's their sin. Like priests, like people, the Word of God says. He was to bring a young bullock, which was a most valuable animal of all. And the position of the one who sinned determined the type of animal for his sin offering, his sin sacrifice. His sin was no different, but his responsibility was greater. And you remember James, a very practical man, he said, "'My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation.'" That's James 3, 1. "'My brother, why do you want to be a preacher?' Makes you more responsible. Why do you want to sing a solo? It makes you responsible. Why in the world do you want to be a deacon or an officer in a church or teach a Sunday school class? You're more responsible than anyone else. And he'll hold you to it, by the way. And that's what he's saying here. We are told that, "...for the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath which was since the law maketh a son who's consecrated forever." And that's the difference between Christ, our great high priest, and the order of Aaron. They were just weak men like we are. And they had to have an offering. But our Lord, he offered for you and me. Then verse 4, "...he shall bring the bullock under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord." Now, this is the same ritual for the sin offering that you actually have with a burnt offering, a striking similarity. And then, verses 5 and 6, "...and the priest that is anointed shall take the bullock's blood, bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood, sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary." Now, to sprinkle the blood seven times before the veil secured God's relationship with the offender. Now, will you notice, that's not all. And I'll go into this. And the priests shall put some of the blood from the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle, the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle, the congregation. Now, this may sound to you bordering on paganism, but has a wonderful spiritual message here. Now, to put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of incense, and that altar incense was the place of prayer, that indicates that Christ has made a sacrifice, that when you and I confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we are restored to the privilege of worship and to the place of prayer and to fellowship. And it all is dependent on the blood of Christ. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. You see, the remainder of the blood was poured out at the bottom of the brazen altar. This satisfied the conscience of the sinner and removed any guilt complex. My friend, the thing for you to understand and for me to understand that when Christ forgives your sin, he forgives you, friend. Nothing more to be said about it. He has put it in the bottom of the sea, and it'll never be remembered anymore. He settles the sin question. That'll get rid of your guilt complex. Somebody, oh, I wonder if he forgiven me. Oh, my friend, <laughs> he took it all away. He took it all away. This was the remedy, you see, for the conviction of sin. And the only one that could satisfy the mind and heart. And when you come to Christ and see him, you'll find him adequate. And we are told here that for the sin offering follows the same ritual as the peace offering. From here on, the fat's burned on the altar. 
and fellowship is complete and service is restored, you see. And that fat, you remember, that means God's called you to enjoy the best. And we're told, and the skin of the bullock and all his flesh, with his head, with his legs, his innard, his dung, even the whole bullock, shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out, and burn him on the wood with fire. Where the ashes are poured out shall he be burned. Now, at this point, we have a radical departure from the other offerings. The remainder of the bullock was taken without the camp, and it was burned there. Now, we believe that this is just simply an emphasis upon the exceeding sinfulness of sin. This animal was a sin offering, and there is no thought of the consecration or the person of Christ. Rather here, he is made sin for us. And I think even a deeper meaning is suggested in Hebrews 13. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. My, we need to ponder this Scripture well. Religion can never satisfy the heart or meet the holy requirements of God. Friends, only the death of Christ on the cross can give us forgiveness of sins. It took that. We are sinners by nature. We are not fit for heaven. And if God consign this entire world into a lost eternity, the angels in heaven would still sing, Holy, 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 and he's righteous and good. But thank God he didn't do that. He loved us. And our sin is frightful, but he was made sin for us. Oh, my friend today, if you've never turned to him and trusted Christ, see that he's adequate. See that he meets the deep need of your heart and your soul. And when you do that, you won't go to the psychiatrist. People think I'm against the psychiatrist. I'm not. I recognize there are certain problems that have to do with that which would be technical. But I'm talking about now old-fashioned sin. And there are too many trying to solve in a different way than God has provided. This is a tremendous truth that is here. This reveals the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the sin offering does, and that religion won't satisfy your heart. And you can't sprinkle a little talcum powder on your sin, and you can't forget it. My friend, deep down underneath, you have a sin nature, and you have that deep down conviction that you are a sinner. Every person has it. You have it. Don't try to tell me you don't, because every individual has that. Now, what is it that can remove that? What is it that can take it away? Well, religion will not satisfy your heart. You can be religious to your fingertips. And a great many people make a great deal of self-effort, and a great many to date try all sorts of cures and nostrums, thinking that they'll remove this. Nothing in the world can remove this sin complex that you and I have. Nothing in the world will take it away but the death of Christ on the cross. And he alone can offer you forgiveness of sin. That is the meaning. That part of the animal had to be taken without the camp. Now we come here to the sins of the congregation. And I read verses 13 and 14. And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty, when the sin which they've sinned against it is known 
Then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, the victim for the entire congregation is the same as for the priest. The young bullock, again, is the most valuable offering. You see, the high priest represented the entire congregation before the Lord, and the requirement, of course, would be the same. Now, I think there's another lesson here. There is not only individual responsibility before God, but there is corporate responsibility. Now, will some of you folks hear me very carefully? God judges nations. And many people that maybe didn't participate in the sin of the nation, they're judged along with it. When Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D., the whole nation went into captivity. That is something that happened. And when the Roman Empire went down, everybody went down with it. And friends, you and I are responsible. We're part of a nation today. And not only that, but God judges churches today, local congregations. I hear people say this, well, you know, my church has gone liberal, but I'm going to stay in and witness. Where'd you get that idea? It's not in the Word of God. May I say to you, if you are identified with that liberal church and a member of it, God will judge you right along with it. Don't get the idea today that you can separate yourself from that which you belong to. Your responsibility is an individual responsibility. And when that individual responsibility leads you to join up with something that's wrong, you'll be held responsible. This is a tremendous truth. The Lord Jesus, for instance, wrote to the seven churches of Asia in Revelation. It was to the churches. Every member of the church was involved. Now, let me read verse 15. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands from the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. You see, the elders represent the nation, as the elders in Revelation represent the church. Now, the ritual here is identical with the offering of the priests. I'll not go over that again. That brings us down now to verse 22, where we have the sins of the ruler. When a ruler hath sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning things which should not be done and is guilty, or if his sin wherein he hath sinned come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. Now, this is a ruler, and this is true, of course, of all these different groups that are to bring an offering because they're sinners. They have responsibility that's different because of their position. The priest, then the congregation, and now the sins of the ruler. And each one, it says, and is guilty. This is not a rumor. <laughs> Guilt must be established. It's so easy to charge people in places of responsibility today and to be inaccurate about it. Before he's to bring the offering, it's to be determined whether he's guilty or not. It's not hearsay, it's not gossip, but it is guilt. And we're told that if his sin come to the knowledge, he shall bring his offering. Now, the ruler again is in a place of responsibility. It's a civil ruler, of course, we're talking about here. And this, unfortunately, is something that our politician, I was going to say statesman, but I'm afraid that it's not the word for them today. Our politicians do not seek to please God. I've listened to them on TV, in the news that's given, and in the interviews that they have, and I have yet. Uh, here one, Democrat, Republican, or what have you, that feels he has a responsibility to God. Publicly, they don't say that. They're always trying to please the people. And today, more and more, they're saying, we want to please our constituents. And, of course, that is about as big a fabrication 
as you possibly could have, because that's the last thing that they really do. But may I say, God says they are responsible to him. I candidly wouldn't want certain offices today. I wouldn't seek them out at all. I sometimes think that a man that even talks about running for a very prominent office, that he really ought to have his head examined, because the tremendous responsibility that'll be on him, not before the people, that's there, of course, but he's responsible to God. Now, we're told he's to bring a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. And then we have the same ritual and procedure that you have in the others, but the offering is not as valuable as the bullock. But the goat reveals his responsibility in the fact that it is a male. Now you have the sins of the common people here. That is Joe Dokes and John Doe, by the way. And that's you and I. We're talking about common people now. Verse 27, "...and if any of the common people sin through ignorance..." while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty. We're talking about common people, talking about you, talking about me. And the offering was for a sin through ignorance. And it was against the commandment of God. And that is something specifically stated as being forbidden. And it has to be established again that he's guilty, that this is not just hearsay. Now, this offering was to lift the guilt complex and to satisfy the conscience. You see, again, friends, the death of Christ alone can lift the crushing guilt complex from modern man. Psychological procedures have not been able to accomplish this. The conscience may be seared with a hot iron, and you may transfer the guilt complex from one area to another. But down deep in the human heart, there is this strange guilt complex that will linger on and on and on, and it's only as you bring it to Christ. Now we're told here, verse 28, "...or if his sin which he hath sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats, a female, without blemish for his sin, which he hath sinned. Now, something may come to his knowledge later, and it's no longer a sin through ignorance, but it requires the same sacrifice. And today, what does the believer do? Well, we go to Christ as a lost sinner, and we accept him as Savior. And then as believers, we find out that we sin. So what do we do? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, it's a kid of the goats, a female. Now, you see again, the offering is of less value than any previous offering for any group. The offering was required, but all point to the death of Christ. Now, the ritual here again is the same as it was for the others, because all has to be put on the basis of the death of Christ. Now, that brings us down here in this final clause of this chapter, "...and it shall be forgiven him." Do you note that? "...it shall be forgiven him." That's an important truth. And complete forgiveness was secured for the sinner. Total absolution was accomplished when Christ died, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now we come in chapter 5 to the trespass offering. And here we have sin as an act. And I must say, though, that some expositors, they treat these first 13 verses here of chapter 5 as part of the sin offering. There is, I think, ample justification for this. But the word trespass here is important, but it probably 
should be translated guilt or for his guilt. But we find that the sin offering is required for the trespass because the act of sin is caused by the nature of sin. The acts must be laid to the root of the tree, always. You and I got that nature. All sin comes from the same sowers. That old sin nature that you and I got from Adam came down to us. We are going to treat this entire chapter as the trespass offering. Now, what is a trespass? I think all of us know that today. Do you ever walk down the street, start to cut across a corner where there's a grassy lot, and you saw a sign that says, No trespassing. Well, you know what that means, don't you? Well, trespassing means the invasion of the rights of others. I think that the word liberty is the most abused thing today. A lot of these folks running around talking about they want their liberty, burning things down and parading. Well, my friend, you have a perfect right to swing your fist any way you want to. But where my nose begins, your liberty leaves off. You have no right to interfere with somebody else's liberty, you see. And it's a trespass when you do. We all have a sinful nature, a fallen nature. In fact, man is totally depraved. He has actually no capacity for God whatsoever. Now, you may think that's strong, and it is, but God makes it very clear that he just cannot, will not, accept the works of a unsaved man. God is not saving the unsaved by their works. He says their righteousness is filthy rags, and that it's not by works of righteousness that he saves us by grace. But notice what he says in the 8th of Romans at verse 7, "...because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be." It's impossible for an unsaved man to please God. The only way that we can please him when they religious folk in that day came and said, what can we do to do the works of God? What are the works? He says, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. Well, that's to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You and I have a sin nature, and that sin offering dealt with that. Now, the trespass offering here in chapter 5 is sin as an act. And you find out in these first few verses here, the first 13 verses, some have treated them as part of the sin offering. Well, actually, it's a sin offering because, after all, where do trespasses come from? They come because we have that kind of a nature. Now, we sin because we're sinners. You don't have to wait to sin to become a sinner. You are a sinner, and that's the reason that you sin. Now we have in this trespass offering specific acts of sin that are committed in ignorance, and that's in the first 13 verses. Then you have non-specific acts of sin committed in ignorance, and that's verses 14 to 19. Now, when you come to chapter 6, you have specific acts of sin committed deliberately. So you have here the trespass offering. And then you have the law of the trespass offering over in chapter 7. Now let's look here at these specific acts of sin that are committed in ignorance. And I think probably to get into the chapter, let me read the first verse. And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness whether he hath seen or known of it. If he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. What does he mean by this? Well, first of all, let me say that there are four specific sins that are listed here. And the question would naturally arise, are these the only specific things that you could commit that are sin? No. 
These are given merely as examples. Tell the truth, I think you could have filled up the rest of the book of Leviticus with specific sins. Some preacher several years ago back east, he made up a list of sins. He had spent some time getting it together, and he had listed, I believe it was 800 specific sins. And by the way, he was just swamped with letters from people who wanted the list of sins. The fact of the matter is, they wanted the list of sins because they thought maybe there was something they were missing, and they knew they were not doing 800 things, so they wanted the list. Well, here we have four, and the sins that are mentioned here are merely given to us as examples, and this would apply to anything that could be called a trespass. Now, we have this, if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing, and this has been translated, if a person sin in this respect. You see, it has to do here with the hearing of an oath, whether he hath seen or known of it. If he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity." You see, it's the case of a witness who does not tell all he knows. He withholds truth to the detriment of some individual. And this is a sin of omission, by the way. There are a lot of sins like that. Now, there are a great many folk in church today. They come in, they think their hands are clean. They say, well, I didn't murder anybody this week, and I didn't break the speed limit. And I certainly didn't steal. But the very interesting thing is that he didn't tell all the truth, though. James put it like this in James 4, 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. You find over in 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, verse 31, this is said. If any man trespass against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear. And the oath come before thine altar in this house. Then hear thou in heaven, and do and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head, and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. And this is not telling the truth when you ought to tell the truth. Let me give an example of what I'm trying to say here. Here is a gossip in a little town, and she's crossing the square, the street there, and as she is, she sees one of the prominent citizens of the town, the president of the bank, who has a lovely home and a lovely wife, and she sees him crossing the street, and lo and behold, a car runs into a secretary at the bank that's crossing the street, knocks her down. And the president of the bank, he rushes over, he picks her up in his arms and takes her into a doctor's office there. And so what happens? This gossip who saw that rushes to the telephone, and she calls up the wife of the president of the bank, and she says, Do you know, Madge, that I saw your husband with another woman in his arms. Now, that's the truth, isn't it? I mean, by that, let me put it like this. That's the facts, but it's not the truth. You see, just withheld information. She didn't tell the whole story. There are a lot of sins of omission today. I had the experience not long ago of a group of Christian men in a meeting and they were talking about the pastor, and they gave certain information that actually was accurate. But it wasn't the truth. <laughs> they didn't tell it all. They just told part of it. And they were willing to let that group of men leave there believing that they had heard the entire truth. May I say that's a trespass. And that's one of the most vicious sins that can be committed today. It's number one, by the way, on God's sin parade here that he mentions. Over in Proverbs, God says there's seven things that he hates, and number one is a lying tongue. 
And that's what you have here. You remember when our Lord was put on oath, when they questioned him, he kept quiet, didn't say a word. And we read in Matthew 26, 63, but Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Now the Lord Jesus broke his silence. He was no longer dumb like a sheep before his shearers. Why? He's under oath, you see. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You see, when he's put under oath, he spoke. Now, we have the second thing mentioned here. Number two, or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of unclean cattle or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Now, this is the law concerning uncleanness. A man may become polluted by contact with a dead animal without being aware of it, while others are witnesses. They know what he did. Now, a dead carcass caused uncleanness by contact. Why was that true? Well, death, you see, is the result of sin, and the wages of sin is death. And therefore, he's to keep away from that which represents sin. Now, this speaks of the Christian today out in the world. A great many people, they walk down through the streets of Los Angeles. You get your eyes dirty. You can't help it in this town, besides smog, by the way. And you hear things. And you sometimes think things. May I say to you, we get unclean. Now, you can't rush into God's presence. And it may be that... Some of these things may be hidden from us. We may not realize it. The psalmist said in Psalm 19, 12, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And as we said the other day, this man always prayed and made this statement, Lord, if I've sinned, forgive me. And Mel Trotter got tired of hearing that, and he said, Why don't you tell the Lord what it is? The man says, I can't think what it is. And Mel Trotter told him, says, you guess at it. And he said, you know, he hit it the very first time. I don't think you'll have much trouble, but we ought to also pray. Forgive us if we sin that we don't know about. And it was a trespass because it was offensive to others, and it was a transgression of the law. Whoso committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And that's one of the definitions. That's in 1 John 3, 4. Now, verse 3, "...or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be, that a man shall be defiled withal, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty." Now, that's the same as the case of an unclean animal, yet God makes a distinction between man and beast here. The penalty for this is more severe than that of the beast. Apparently, there were other distinctions of uncleanness concerning man other than death, therefore, so that you are apt to get soiled walking through this world. Now, verse 4, we have the fourth thing that's mentioned here specifically. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him, when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. Now, sometimes we promise to do something, we don't do it. We forget about it. Something like this, it's rather careless. We promise that we'll serve the Lord. I think Jephthah is an example of a man promising to do something rash, to offer his daughter. That was a rash thing to do. And Simon Peter, you remember, boldly declared he would not deny Jesus, but he'd die for him. I hear people make very rash statements. I think some of our songs 
or dynamite to tell the truth. I'll go with him through the garden. I see people that will sing that, and they wouldn't even come to church on Sunday night if it was foggy a little or a little sprinkle. And then they talk about going with him through the garden. That's careless speech. In fact, they're lying, doing nothing in the world but lying. I used to have a retired Methodist preacher attended my church out in Pasadena at the end of the service and give hymns like that to sing. I don't do that anymore, but I did then. And he'd always, when he'd go out, and we'd had a song like that, why he'd say to me, well, you made liars out of this congregation again today. Well, if you sing those and you don't mean them, you're a liar, friends. I didn't say that. That's what God says here. And I don't think we have a right to demand that God answer our prayer. I think that's careless speech, and I think it's presumptuous, because we are told, if ye ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, where'd you get the idea you can demand anything of God? And then he says here, then he shall be guilty of one of these. Well, it refers to these four things, yet there are many more that could have been included. Now, notice verses 5 and 6. It shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Now, the offering is a sin offering, but it was because of a trespass. Now, you see, confession is commanded for the first time. This is the first time God said anything about it. And up to this time, of course, hasn't been secret sin. The fact of the matter is the offering was an open admission. Now it's a secret sin. And therefore today, this is to be brought out in the open. You remember old Achan, when he took that wedge of gold, Babylonian garment, that had to be dealt with publicly because it was that kind of a sin. And we find here the laying on of hands, in the other offerings was an admission of sin. And here, confession comes first and then the offering. See, in the sweet save offerings, the offerings preceded any thought of confession. Now, the opposite is true here. And I think this is what our Lord had in mind in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer your gift. Now, the believer today is to confess his sin to God privately, but make restitution to the injured party. And trespass offering just simply means offering of guilt. It was a sin offering, as all sin, you see, comes from that nature that we have today. Now we are told in verse 7, And if he be not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for the trespass which he hath committed two turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Well, this is for the poor people. But suppose he couldn't even get a bird. And he shall bring them unto the priest, he shall offer him. And then we are told here that the blood must be shed, because the head of the bird had to be removed. And it reveals here that the sinner has complete forgiveness even with the little bird. But notice this. But if he be not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that sins shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for his sin offering. In other words, he just bring a piece of bread. That's all he'd have to bring, so that the poorest of the poor are not left out. Now you have, beginning at verse 14, nonspecific acts of sin committed in ignorance. Now, there are a lot of things that are not specified. Listen to this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flocks, and so on. Now, we have here these nonspecific things. This is a wrong committed through ignorance. 
and it has to do with robbing God in connection with tithes and offerings. This is something that I wish we could go into in detail, but we can't do that. Then we read in verse 17, "...and if a soul sin, commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not, knew it not, yet is he guilty." and shall bear his iniquity. Ignorance of the law excuses no one. That's true of civil law. And then verses 18 and 19, "...he shall bring a ram without blemish." And here again, the ram is given as the only animal for the trespass offering. Now, we want to consider chapter 6 and 7, which have to do with the law of the offerings. And then we have laws concerning the burnt offering, the meal offering, and the sin offering here in chapter 6. And then we'll take up the others when we get to chapter 7. Now, we have some very specific directions here for the priests. We need to note that some have labeled these chapters here special rules for the priests who minister at the altar of God. And you'll notice that these rules, or law of the offerings, is directed to the priests. That is important to note. It opens, you see, that is, this particular section, he shall command. That's quite interesting, that he shall command Aaron and his sons. We need to also recognize that the priests were the ones who served at the altar, and they were involved in all of the offerings that were made on the burnt altar. We are told in Hebrews 8, 3, and 5, "...for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. If he were on earth, he should not be a priest." seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Now we can see from the above Scripture that not only do the priests alone serve at the burnt altar, but all is a shadow of the reality in heaven where Christ, our great high priest, serves today. Therefore, these are great spiritual lessons for us. Now, there's another striking thing about the law of the offerings, that Christ is not only the sacrifice, but he's also the priest. He offered himself. There was no priest there to offer him. He offered himself. And this is what we're told. And again, let me give this extended quotation from Hebrews 10. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it's written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin, thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified." through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and every high priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down on the right hand of God. Now, that is the thing we need to be made aware of today. A religion down here with marching and burning of candles and wearing robes and going through little rituals and preliminaries and all that sort of thing really has no value today at all. 
In fact, a lot of us in our churches, we go through a lot of things that are really not worthwhile at all. Because those that worship God must worship Him in spirit and truth. Now, God gave these things to set before us great spiritual truths so that we would see that. Now, you and I have a high priest that is in heaven today, and he's as busy as he can be. Now, when he says he sat down, it means that his redemption was complete. It's just the same as when it says God rested on the seventh day. He wasn't tired. Lord Jesus didn't sit down up there to do nothing. He's busier today than he's ever been. He died down here to save us. He lives up yonder to keep us safe. And you and I ought to keep in touch with him. This is reality. This is spiritual. The trouble today is we're out of touch with the living Christ. And he's no longer a reality to us. The greatest compliment I ever heard passed on a preacher was the one I succeeded in Nashville, Tennessee. I went into the market house there one day where all the butcher shops were. And there was a great big German butcher in there. And he said to me, he said, I understand you are following Dr. Allen. I said, yes. He said, you know, the thing about that man, every time I meet him, I feel like he just left Jesus around the corner. I want to tell you, friends, that's doing business with him. He should be a reality to us today. Now you have specific acts of sin committed deliberately. Now, this is in chapter 6, the first seven verses. We are told here, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin committed trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor, and that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor. You see, trespass is largely a sin against others. A sin against the neighbor is a sin against God. A sin against others is a sin against God. That's the reason our Lord said, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. This is the law and the prophets. You see, that covers all of that. And that which is taken by violence. You remember Naboth had his vineyard stolen by Ahab. What an awful thing. And he was slain. And then a little later on, you remember John says, If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. You see, this has to do with a man's relationship to God. Now, verses 8 and 9. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, notice that, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It's the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night under the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. Now, that fire was to burn continually, and it means continuously only while the tabernacle was set up and not on a wilderness march. It's obvious it wasn't burning then. Now, the burnt offering was left on the altar all night for a definite purpose, and the fire was kept burning in order that it all might be consumed. It was called the burnt altar, you know. And this speaks of the continual consecration of Christ. I find that when we're told that we're to offer ourselves a living sacrifice unto God, that's the hardest kind to make because when you crawl upon the altar and they fire gets hot, I crawl off. I don't know about you. I find a lot of folk do that. But it was only the Lord Jesus. He could say, I do always the things that please him. I wish I could say that. I'm afraid you can't say it. But the Lord Jesus could. But that's a challenge to every believer today because God delights in the continual obedience of his children. This is I think, real food for God. What? Love and obedience. And listen to this. The Lord Jesus in his high priestly prayer said, "...and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth." And you remember Samuel rebuked old Saul by saying, "...hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord." Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. 
For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And today we need to recognize that you and I need to have our own hearts and lives offered to him if we belong to him. If we've been saved today, God forbid that it be just a profession. Now listen to him again in John 4, here, verse 31. In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. <laughs> oh, how he delight in your obedience and mine. And King Saul was rejected because of his obedience. And the woman at the well was accepted because of her obedience. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered, said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Now, the priest, we're told here, shall put on his linen garment, his linen breeches, shall he put upon his flesh, take up the ashes, which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, he shall put them beside the altar, and he shall put off his garments, put on other garments, carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. Now, God gave instructions concerning even the garments the priests to wear. You see, he was not only to put on the long robe, which is common to all priests, but also the linen breeches. Why? The flesh must be covered totally. God today cannot receive or accept the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, Paul said to the Galatians. And it's an ugly brood, by the way. And Paul added, I tell you before, as I have told you also in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. My friend, the works of the flesh he can do without. And only the fruit of the Spirit is acceptable to him. The fruit of the Spirit's love, joy, peace, long-suffering. These are the things that the Spirit of God can produce in our lives. Now, the garments the priest wore when he removed the ashes were taken off and a fresh suit put on. You see this continual reminder of the utter pollution of sin. While the ashes of the altar spoke primarily the judgment of sin, that fire had been burning. And even the ashes are contaminated, and they must be taken out like this and put in a clean place outside of the camp. What a picture today of how defiling sin is. Verse 12, And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. He shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering." Now, again, another reminder that the fire is to burn continually. A fresh fire was made in the morning, and a burnt offering made for the total camp. This was the morning sacrifice. Verse 13, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. How important that is. This is something we need to note today. Then we have the law concerning the meal offering, verse 14, and this is the law of the meal offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord, before the altar, and he shall take of it his handful of the flour of the meal offering, and the oil thereof, and frankincense, and so on. And you see, again, the instructions are directed to the priests. The offerer is a worshiper who stands before the altar rejoicing before God, and the priest performs for him. Now we are told, verses 16 and 17, "...and the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat with unleavened bread, and unleavened shall it be eaten." That's the rendering of the Septuagint version. That's important, unleavened bread. Leaven speaks of evil. And the holy place is, I think here, the outer court. It was holy because God was there. God said, do you remember to Moses at the beginning, Draw not nigh hither, put off your shoes. Place whereon thou standest is holy ground. 
Now you'll notice verse 18. All the males among the children of Aaron shall eat of it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. See, all believers can participate in the enjoyment of the beauties and glories of the holy humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, you and I need to rejoice in him more than we are today. The priests, by the way, were not only to eat, but also to offer a tithe of the meal offering. The priests in turn who took a tenth were to offer a tenth. All of the tithe must be offered. Priests must give as well as receive. Ministers today ought to set an example to their congregation this matter of giving. I've attempted as pastor over the years to urge the staff sitting on the platform to give and that the offering plate be passed. We're a part also. We have then the law concerning the sin offering. That concludes this chapter. And the instructions are repeated again here to the priests. Now, notice just this one thing. The sin offering speaks of the work of Christ on the cross. You see, this speaks of the person of Christ. Christ must be holy, harmless, and free from sin to be a satisfactory offering for sin. He must be able to save. You see, the virgin birth is essential to the plan of salvation. A believer cannot deny the virgin birth. The sin offering was holy because Christ was free from sin, though he was made sin for us. It was my sin on him that caused him to have to die, not his or just because he was arrested by the Romans and tried. He could have stepped off this earth any moment. Why, he told Peter, put up your sword. I could have legions of angels here if it was necessary. Now, here in the law of the sin offering, we find that the place for the sin offering is the same as for the burnt offering. Both refer to Christ here. And then we find the sin offering was holy. That's strange. It's holy. The priest that offer it for sin shall eat it. In the holy place shall it be eaten in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled of the blood there upon any garment, thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled in the holy place. Now, the sin offering was holy, we're told. You remember the Lord Jesus on the cross cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me in the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent, but thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. On the cross, Christ became sin for us, but he was holy. God withdrew from him, yet God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Let me say this, and let's not let it out, because some folk think I know the answer to all these questions, but I don't. May I say, I don't know. I don't understand this. This is a great mystery. He was holy, and my sin was put upon him. And my friend, he's still holy. You and I will never know what he suffered there on the cross, because he's holy, and you and I are not. We do not know what suffering really is. Now, we're even told that the earthen vessel wherein it's sodden shall be broken. And if it's a brazen pot that it was in, why, it'll be rinsed and cleansed with water. My, how meticulous this was. You see, the offering is for sin, and sin just isn't holiness. It's the opposite. And God is continually saying to you and me, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he'll have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens 
are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's Isaiah 55, 7 and 9. You see, you and I today need to be reminded of the fact that he saved us from sin, not saved us to sin. That's very important. Paul says in Romans, shall we continue in sin? God forbid.